Heroes of Might and Magic 7 is the latest game to be released in the Ubisoft continuity in 2015 and was developed by Limbic Entertainment, who was only known for making Might and Magic games with Six and Legacy. The founders of the company were former employees of Sunflower Interactive, known for the Anno series. The game would also get an expansion pack and DLC with The Lost Tales of Axioth in 2016, receiving mixed responses with critics, scoring 67 out of 100 on Metacritic, and the game uses the base of Hero 6, which is not a good sign. I don't have a lot of history with this game as I've been sticking more with 5 and earlier. So the premise of this game is that it takes 200 years after 6 and with the assassination of Empress Maeve, a civil war ensues and you follow Ivan Griffin and his war council to win the civil war. And in the campaign you play different scenarios with different plots and factions like Dungeon, Haven, Sylvan, Academy, Stronghold, Necropolis and the expansion given you the Fortress faction. The different campaigns range from pretty good to... Can you please shut up? You play as different factions and one thing I really like is that you get to pick the story you want to play. Since in Heroes 5, you were forced to complete the last chapter in order to see another faction story. Sure, the story is not connected like 5, but it could be like Heroes 3 where there's an overarching story of Sandra's rise to power but you have other main characters like Craig Hack and Jem that gives you pieces to the whole overarching story. Then you have the final chapter that you unlock after beating all the other stories. The gameplay is pretty much the same as 5 and 6. The overworld uses a 3D environment with resource buildings, creature dwellings, castles and forts. One function in the game that was introduced in 6 into the series was borders. When playing on a map, there are borders connected to forts and castles, and if you control the area, or no one does, you are able to capture resource buildings and creature dwellings. If you lose the fort slash castle, every building in the area is captured by the person who captured the castle or rebuilt the fort. And if you try to capture an ore pit by another player, you get the option to plunder it, which seems to give you like 2 or 3 days worth of production. Plundering also removes all or most most of your movement points. I don't really like the border because it makes for more swing turns. A common thing that happened to me was that I rebuilt the fort, then the enemy recaptures the fort, and it happened like three turns in a row because the enemy had more movement points than me, so I could not fight the hero. One thing I did not expect when it came to castles is that they have 2D pictures over 3D animated overscales like in 5. So I was a little bit shocked going from 3D to 2D in a moment, as once again I expected the game to be entirely based around 3D like in 5. Castle building is the same as in 5, where you have to level up your castle in order to reach the higher tier creatures and buildings, so you can't do a capital rush or you can't do a Byron Rush like in Heroes 3. There are also some building tabs that are split into two different buildings where building one makes you unable to build the other, like the Heroes 4 creature dwellings. There is one building that I don't like, and it's because it's in every faction castle, even though that it doesn't make any sense, and that is Town Portal. So basically, whenever you're outside of your own castle borders, you can teleport to your castle using a spell called Town Portal. This only teleports you to the area where you have Town Portal built, but like it doesn't make sense with some of these factions. So one of the main things for why I think this is a bad thing is that it makes every faction less unique and factions that are very anti-magic less believable because Stronghold, which is a entirely barbarian tribe's society that was enslaved by wizards are very anti-magic in this. So for example, if Academy and Dungeon were the only ones that had Town Portal, I would have been fine with it because these two are more magical in nature. It honestly feels like they were trying to make a competitive scene over just making sense. Another mechanic that reminds me of Heroes 4 is that heroes can run around with no units. Whenever a hero with no units is attacked, they disappear in a smoke cloud. They probably lose all artifacts they have when this happens. The enemy player gains no experience from this, so you can be very annoying. Just like that one fly when you're trying to get him out the window. Also, while on the topic of heroes, heroes have six subclasses and they are set up as Might Offense, Might Balance, Might Defense, Magic Offense, Magic Balance, and Magic Defense. And something that is connected with heroes is experience. And experience in this game is pretty insane. I have leveled up multiple times from one battle despite needing like 60k plus experience to level up. 
Hero 7 uses a new system for skills as you have a skill wheel that you can decide what perks and skills you want, which changes depending on if you're a might or a magic character, and factions. For example, the top part of the wheel is a faction unique skill. Academy have meta magic, dungeon have shroud of malasa, and fortress has anger issues, go figure. And the max level cap is 30. There isn't much more to talk about with heroes except in the ways that they work in combat. In combat, heroes can cast spells or attack, but they don't take an active role in combat like Heroes 4, returning to the more general role of older games. Combat in this game isn't hexagonal since 5, but it's now quadragonal, which makes it a bit harder to move when there are obstacles in combat. Units can be 1 times 1, or they can be 2 times 2 in terms of size. They will cover more squares. And in determining combat order, you use a thing called initiative, which once again was a change in Heroes 5, as older games only used speed to determine the order. In this game, speed only determines how far they can move. Some other things that units can do is wait, defend, and attack. Some units have special abilities, like harpies have the ability to swing, and then return to where they started their turn. A new feature in this game in combat is that units can flank and take cover. Flanking is when you attack an enemy unit from behind, deal an extra 50% damage, which leads to most fights looking like this. I'm not the biggest fan of this mechanic because it's so powerful that you will always go for it. Maybe they could have changed it to by having another friendly unit be next to the target that you want to flank, adding a little bit more strategy into this strategy top-down game. And then cover makes the unit take about 50% less damage from ranged units. Cover is an automatic thing that happens when you're behind walls and obstacles in combat, which is a fine mechanic since it uses the environment in order to gain a benefit. I want to talk about spells since I went on this very minor combat introduction. Spells in this game have reverted to a more basic schools of magic like fire, air, earth, and water, but they also have prime, dark, and light magic. Comparing it to Heroes 5, this looks wonderful as it allows for more customization if you want to play as a water magic master, where in Heroes 5, all the elemental magic was put under destruction magic. Despite having 7 different schools of magic, there's not a lot of spells in this game. So for example, Tier 1 spells have 3 spells in total, Tier 2 have 2 spells, Tier 3 have 2 spells, and Tier 4 only had 1 until the expansion came out. So you have 7 schools with 9 spells in total, so that equals 63 spells, wherein Heroes 3 had about 70 to 72 spells with more tiers as well as only 4 schools of magic. My problem with this is that you're gonna see the same spell a lot more so you can focus on what school the magic guild is going to be, making it easier to see spells of a certain school. Also, the firewall spell is actually broken. And I don't mean it in a sense that it's really strong, but it's actually broken. If you put the firewall on top of an enemy, the AI will get stuck moving in and out of the firewall until they die or to a point where a single archer can kill them. And before I go talk about different plots of the campaigns, there are a bunch of small problems with optimization. The frame rate is pretty unstable when going on the highest settings, and sure, this could just be my computer, but it's something to think about. It also seems to have a problem with targeting with the default camera angle, which can be fixed by rotating camera. For example, in this clip, I'm trying to attack the stack with 2 in it with my hero's attack, but it keeps targeting the stack with 36 in it. Skip to this time if you don't want spoilers. So, the way that the plot is set up for the different scenarios is as stories. Tales from a somewhat old time. You have four chapters to play for each faction, besides Haven and Acropolis, where Haven gets another two chapters, which you unlock after completing all other campaigns, and Necropolis has five. <coughs> Favoritism! <coughs> I'm going to personally rank them from worst to best, in my opinion. Sixth place... Academy. The message in this story is so blunt it broke my nose. And it became annoying because they kept repeating the good and bad things that people go on because of love. For example, in chapter 2, you play as the creator of Golems and his story is about how he's driven to a point of no return for the sake of his daughter that passed away. And he created a Golem that reflects her and eventually after bringing her back to life only comes to bite him in the ass. It's very plain about what they are talking about. Fifth place, Sylvan Campaign. 
This one is just plain boring. The main character is a sea elf castaway after a stormy night. He then finds sylvan elves that are also castaways and they want help to get to an island. But there's a maelstrom that leads to open waters that is blocked by cyclops. So we need to deal with them. You then become an escort mission to help these two people to the island. It's honestly just boring. Fourth place, Necropolis there. It's just mediocre. I don't really have anything else to say about it. Third place, Stronghold. I think this story is a little bit more interesting because it talks about how the orcs and the beastmen revolted against the wizards and the immediate consequences that happened when they weren't secured as slaves. But okay, but let's take it to the first chapter. So in the first chapter, you're playing as Amani and you're trying to force an alliance with the beastmen. In chapter 2, you have to deal with a split tribe where followers of Jengo and Amani needs to fight to see where the tribe goes. Jengo wants to fight the wizard to the very end, while Amani wants the tribe to find a different area and settle. So it's a lot more character driven and clashes between two different people. So it's a lot more interesting, but because we are playing as Amani, we obviously follow Amani's journey. So You will then eventually play on how the tribe finds a new home and manages to settle. Second place, the dungeon campaign. Surprisingly, I really like the story and the gameplay for Dungeon in this game. Ever since Heroes 5, I never liked Dungeon because it felt too weak. But anyways, the story is about the Blade of Erebos. Erebos was a faceless assassin who was sealed away due to the Twilight Covenant, which was a peace treaty created between the angels and the faceless. And Erebos mind called a dark elf named Salvin and his two disciples. With these three, it came to be known as the Blade of Erebos. But the general gist of this entire campaign is that you try to make the Empire and the Wizards have a war and so the seeds of suspicion between them. So you need to stay out of sight and create a shadow war, I guess you can call it, or a war from the shadows. It's honestly very interesting. And then my first place is Haven. It strictly goes on this spot because of chapter 3, which I find fantastic. But I have to talk about the earlier chapters, so here we go. You play as Thomas the Tank Engine from the Wolf Duchy. You are sent out to fix a bridge, and after fixing the bridge, the Griffin Duchy has apparently taken over a town that used to be under wolf control. And as you retake the castle, we are then forced to defend the castle until the attacking Griffins stops. And due to political bullshit that involves an ancient map that apparently was written by a former emperor and was given to the griffin and the time was also given to the griffins thomas was forced to either become a priest or join his uncle in the far east chapter 2 takes place after thomas decided to work with his uncle we need to re-establish safe trade by securing the roads we then actually get to talk to the guy who would lose his daughter in the academy campaign then surprise demon Honestly, the demon subplot in this chapter is not good at all. Because we never met this character earlier and she turns out to be a demon 10 minutes after we talked to her for the first time. But anyway, you get to play as Masfar against Gloria the demon and we have to stop her yet. Okay, okay, I can't fucking take it anymore. Let's talk about chapter 3. The chapter starts with Thomas's uncle, Conrad, shielding orcs and beastmen, and then the Imperial Armada wants him to hand them over, but he decides not to follow the order. This results in a defense sequence where you try to hold them off for as long as you can while delaying in order to defend the town of Hammerfall. You have a one-man army holding off the entire Imperial Armada, killing enemies in the thousands. This is why I absolutely love this fucking chapter man it's just this defense part with conrad i don't know how else to describe it but it feels amazing to play though though i have to say that the ai breaks with my top notch strategy of standing there i also like the way that the story is told to us or at least the dialogue for characters you have two portraits of the characters that speak with each other and if there's a third character they are usually placed on the arc in the middle and it's fully voiced this is the imperial armada we can't win they're in their thousands. Thomas, sometimes you fight because it is the right thing to do. I'll keep them ashore as long as I can. Ride fast and hard, burning the bridges behind you to give Hammerfall time to prepare its defense. The expansion was released on October 5th, 2016, and adds in a new Grandmaster spell for each school, or a tier 4 spell. 
a new campaign story, new neutral units, new music, oh, and an entirely new faction. Fortress is a faction of short kings, which has a new revamped way of the rune function from 5. We place it on the map instead of each unit having runes that cost resources to use. But the time that I played with this faction, it feels rather weak. And this is weird because Fortress was my favorite in Heroes 5 and Dungeon was my least favorite. Now it has completely reversed. But yeah, I don't really have much to talk about when it comes to the expansion. Going into this, I did not expect a lot, but there are some sizable things I like in this actually. The story being one of them and the Haven music is super good. But most of the time it's just average, and has some clear problems with enemy AIs. The game is not hard either, so I could easily beat the campaigns by stockpiling on one hero, and I never really needed heroes, whether that's for exploration or fighting. It feels like it was rushed out too early, and since the last update was in 2016, it's gonna stay like this. And honestly, if you want to have a better game, play 5. Also, can we stop with having a launcher for every company? Bullshit!